Welcome to The Color Code. My name is Cullen Kelly, and I love talking to people about making and shaping motion images. My guest today is Siggy Firstel, senior colorist at Company 3 and one of my favorite colorists in the game, with credits including Wednesday, Narcos, The Boys, Togo, Lost in Space, and so many other amazing looking projects. We had a fantastic conversation about Siggy's long journey in this business and how he's managed to continue to innovate his craft for all the many years that he's been doing this. Before we dive in, today's episode is brought to you by Portrait Displays, who make amazing calibration products. They're the products that I rely on to keep all of my displays accurate and uh, performing as they need to for my clients. So I'm super proud to have them as a sponsor for this show. Now, without further ado, let's dive into my conversation with Siggy Firstel. Oh boy. I'm really excited this morning. I'm joined by Siggy Firstel, senior colorist at Company 3, and another colorist with a resume that is too stacked to even begin to rattle off half the credits on there, but some of my favorite shows, The Boys, Wednesday, Narcos, uh, so many cool movies in there as well. Excited to have you on the show, Siggy. Great to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's a, there's a lot of titles there. <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean it's it's you know uh started back in 82 so it's been a while 82 82 yeah okay what did it look like to do your job in 82 it was kind of fun because it required a lot of uh um technical now to kind of get the equipment to behave and and work the way you wanted it it's not just like a what we see as computers right now it's um um the the prog the 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 first color corrector i ever used um used punch tape to trigger the the the, the color corrections um on the on the telecine so there was no real communication apart from like stop and play uh between the the color corrector which is hardware based and the the jump scan telecine back then uh -huh. Um, so, uh, there was no things like time code, uh, it was all Q tracks. Um, so we were sending Q points from the Telcine to the color corrector and then the color corrector, we would literally have a strip of paper with punches on it and that would trigger the, uh, color correction. And it was very simple. It was just like primary correction, um, uh, like lift gamma gain, but maybe some secondaries, some really simple secondaries. And um, so it's a, it's a completely different world from what it is now. That's, I mean, I actually didn't know that that was where the like headwaters of color correction yeah. are. I mean, that's really just an inch away from traditional color timing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly how color timing was is, is with that original that punch system. tape. You know, I, I remember getting rolls of, of print film and that, in the can was a strip of punch tape that correlated to the the color timing of that roll of film. Right. Um, so we were essentially the same thing, but you know, in a in a uh, off a telecine. Yeah. Uh, so look, I guess the only real difference is it's yeah. it's landing on a like sensor instead of on a piece of film. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you know, so it was a very different world back then, and then there was you know re iterations. Uh, you know, color corrections, uh, color correctors that were more advanced, like uh, moved on to the Dubner color corrector, and then the the classic uh, Da Vinci res uh, not D Resolve or the classic Da Vinci, right? Um, and then uh, uh, I I think I've literally hit every uh, version of uh, Da Vinci color correction uh, corrector, um, Pogel's uh base lights um so broad broad spectrum of uh, color correctors so to get the the back in those early days to get the the image quality things would drift so if you would if you started a session at 9 a.m by midday 2 p.m the color would have drifted within the telcine um because uh, because of the um, the technology back then just wasn't stable, mm -hmm. uh, so you would have to go in and tweak the uh, 
the adjustments on the Telcine with a little, you, you would walk around with a screwdriver um, and you would adjust the, the RGB levels coming out of the Telcine to, to compensate for that drift. Um, this so, sounds made up. So, this sounds so 100% your color, made up. <laughs> no, no. So your color correction would, would, would so be the same as, as you started. So, right. um, and then you'd have, uh, uh, you'd have dirt issues that would fly in on, you know, from the CRT mm -hmm. scanner. Um, so you'd also not only walk around with a little, little screwdriver, but also a, a paintbrush to, to paint the, uh, the dust off the front of the CRT. Um, so there was a lot of like almost mechanical labor to, to get it working. Um, uh, you would, uh, record onto two inch tape. And, um, back then in an, in an analog world, one of the highest quality images within the post house was coming out of the Telcine. It was full RGB, right? It wasn't going to an analog two inch or one inch tape. So when it came to Chroma King, you had an ultimate actually in the Telcine Bay. Gotcha. We would be piping the, the image out of the Telcine, we color correct it, and then we'd have a background playing off a, a one inch tape or something like that uh -huh. and doing a key and in live in the bay. In line in the, the flow there. Yeah. We would sync the, the foreground and background using cue points uh -huh. and then record it on a, on a, a, a second tape machine. Wow. Um, so we would do a lot of commercials and music videos that way. It was all composited in a, in a sense, um, in, in the Telson eBay. And is this primarily negative that you're working with like film neg that you're on, or is there some cases of video um, source? No, there was very little in, uh, in color correction. There was, it was only ever feature, uh, film, right. um, never any sort of di electronically shot footage. Yeah. And I, I guess that's part of like that, just the interesting journey of all this, like film to digital transition is it didn't happen. It didn't hit all the phases at the same time. Like you were pioneering the post side of things in yeah. the eighties and yes. like s digital cinema cameras didn't start to become viable for another 20 years yeah. from there. Moving forward to sort of the late nineties, early two thousands, um, when, when technology reached a point where we could actually start doing, um, DIs or digital film, as they used to call it. Um, and we were able to scan and um, manipulate the colors. I mean, I remember you know, in the mid 90s, we knew it was going to come. And um, I remember uh, I was working in Sydney at the time, and um, uh, Phillips, who had the d d data cine back mm -hmm. then, um, was holding these courses in Paris about digital film. And that was, um, uh, was all set in, uh, the post house that did like, um, her brother, where art thou and a, a bunch of er those early, um, it was like first DI DIs. Right. So they held this course over this weekend. So I literally flew from Sydney to Paris for the weekend. Um, so it was actually in the air longer than I was on the ground, but, <laughs> Oh my God, it was a, such a, a eye-opening um, experience and it, it really introduced me to doing DIs. Um, and then I knew then that's what I wanted to do. So we, um, we the place I worked at, we, we bought us a, 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 a Spirit Data Cine. I think back then, you know, color correctors were still hardware and we, we used, I think it was, it's hard, I can't remember, but I think it was used a uh, uh, Da Vinci Splice. Mm. And I don't, probably not too many people remember Splice, but um, it was essentially this hardware system uh, that you would capture the data coming out of the, the, the spirit. And then it also would communicate with the da vinci 2k um and uh do a loop through uh so you could color 
in full RGB, 10-bit, uncompressed uh, through the 2K in a digital sense. Oh, I see. So that's your first step away from like a telecine where you're having to go to tape or anything like that. Okay. So um, one of the first films I did was um, House of Flying Daggers. And uh, it it wasn't, it started off just to be, the, the filmmakers reached out and they said, we just have a couple of scenes that we want to do some adjustments on. They were so blown, blown away by the results, those scenes like quickly grew. We, we, d- we didn't do the entire film, but the, the amount of scenes we did like probably tripled um, from their original ideas. And um, uh, I don't know if you remember the film, but there was like yes. the, it went through different, um, uh, seasons. So you had fall and, and we took a lot of the, the greens and, and, and turned them into like gold, like gold leaves. And, and, uh, they had these, um, bamboo forests that were quite dark and it came, the, the bamboo came up very blue and dull and they wanted this kind of fluorescent, you know, rich, uh, new vegetation green. Um, so we, we did a lot of these scenes and, um, it, uh, it was back then we, there wasn't a, we weren't on a projector. We were, we were on a a calibrated monitor, um, that we calibrated to the lab at the time. And, um, that entailed basically, um, getting these uh, scanning these, uh, film patches, like right. essentially like colored bars and like grayscales and the old Marcy, of uh, you know, yep. face and sending it to the lab, getting them to do a film record process, it, yep. process it, print it, and then send it back to us. And then us looking at that, those prints on a light box and adjusting the monitor to what we saw on the light box. Oh, wow. So you're not, we're not even there with like Lutz yet. No. Oh no. my God. No. So that's, that was like, that was early, early days. Yeah. So it was all like, no way it was hundred percent accurate, but I mean, the results were stunning and the cinematographer, um, was nominated for Academy Award that year for, for, for that film. So, you know, um, uh, it did look, the yeah, results were looked amazing. Really great. And so the the first time you were seeing a print of it was that really your first time truly seeing the work you'd yes done yeah yeah wow yeah that is amazing yeah okay so like we've already covered so much ground and the the thing that's going through my head as you're telling me all these amazing stories is I'm thinking about like I'm thinking about your hands and what you're seeing like the the like interface that you're working with and yep. the knobs that you're reaching for and what I want to know is how do you know how to do that. Who taught you to do what you were doing in those early days? Did you just figure it out kind of on your own? Uh, well, I had a mentor, um, you know, experienced colorist, and um, and uh, I, I always remember the the exercise of 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 learning to color, and they basically said it's all about you know, the contrast and getting your, your, your whites and your shadows accurate. Uh Um, so I remember the, an ex, an early exercise that I did was they just gave me some black and white footage to color. So initially it was like, made me think, oh, I'd ignore color. It's all about contrast. Uh, Uh so get the contrast right and consistent the end of the day there are no it's there is no bad color it's just what's bad is inconsistent color right mm-hmm. so um uh getting contrast levels right and consistent is was the first thing i learned okay. and then once i got the hang of that and understood contrast the importance of contrast then i introduced you know then they introduced the color and then that, that, uh, and then that expanded from there. So for me, it was more like 
narrowing my focus and then just building upon that. And that's the same today when I get a new tool. It's like I have a I have a set of go-to tools that I do use now like all the time. And then uh you know I work on a um a resolve black magic resolve. They're introducing new tools all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So uh it doesn't mean I go out and use all those tools straight away. Um I uh usually get comfortable with one or two tools and then slowly expand. I, I, I wait to the right moment uh, to use it. So rather than just use them all, all, all at once, you can kind of get yourself tied in a knot. But Boy, can you ever. <laughs> so, you know, that's how I learned. And, um, you know, uh, that's how we, um, back in the day, I had definitely mentors. I was, I was quite young back then. So um, I was just in awe of everyone. So I think that lesson still holds me in good stead now i mean that it's it's amazing that that's the one that that uh come, leaps first to mind for you because that like if we think about what you described to me and we started this conversation like oh yeah we're using punch tape and like you yeah. know it's such a foreign thing it seems yeah. so different than what we do now sure but what you just said about like nailing contrast and like black point and white point yeah that resonates so big with like i feel like Every time I get into trouble and, and lose my path when I'm color grading, it's because I'm forgetting to get that foundation yeah. in place. You just go back to the basics. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. Okay. So the next one that comes to mind is when I'm thinking about like, you know, controlling foliage, like you were talking about, for example, in the tools of the time, do you remember like, what was the, is that like a matrix operation? Like what was the. What was the knob? You're talking about foliage and stuff? like Yeah, like when you're rotating the hue, like the bamboo uh, thing you were talking about. Okay, yeah. Um, so, I mean, well, that was a Da Vinci 2K back then. So mm-hmm. it had, a, you know, the qualifier is essentially so you could, like, what we hue have. like qualifier. Yeah, it's essentially what we have today in, in the Resolve. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was too different. Got it. Um, uh, so it was like you know, hue saturation luminance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think you could use primary correction through it. It was just um, once you had isolated, then it was like saturation, hue, and luminance adjustments. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a lot of lot of hue adjustments. Got it. Ultimately, yeah. That makes sense. Every, every era has its challenges, right? Um, and, you know, even now that we have so many more tools, um, it doesn't make it any easier uh, uh-huh. or quicker. I mean, you can do what you used to do back in the day quicker, but because you have an expanded tool set, it allows you to do so much more. And, and that's what's so exciting about it, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, technology is moving so fast. Um, and sometimes I find... Uh, Clients, they are thinking of color correction in the traditional way, and they're not really allowing you to to fully expand unless there's an, a real need for it. Like for you know beauty work that we do, like the amount of beauty work we we do now compared to say five years ago is is just exploded because um, clients realize how much more you can do in color correction. Yeah, it's it's the tools that. The tools are incredible and, and, uh, you know, I'm working on a job now that I'm really excited about and I'm pulling a lot of the tools out of the box. Um, you know, I'm doing, I'm using glows all the time. Uh, it's one of my favorite tools, um, non-traditional tools, Mm -hmm. um, lens reflections, um, um, all, all those sort of things to kind of dirty up the image, so to speak, make take the purity out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's like the you know, traditional grain and, 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 and those sort of textures and things like that that you can add as well. But um, this, this particular shows, you know, a lot of it's shot on, on stage, on volume wall. So we want to take that stagey look out of it. So it, it is, we don't want to end up with a grungy image, but we just want to like break it up a little bit and, and, and take the 
the perfection out of it, you know, the yeah. flatness out of it. So, oh man, so many, so many things I want to ask you about there. I mean, like, yeah, first of all, that it's it's really cool to hear you talking about s- over time incorporating all of these like new tools and you know like capabilities that are yep. available in modern color. I mean, I feel like you have that reputation and track record of being a a like very thoughtful but radical adopter of stuff you're like hey right. that works i will use it yeah type of colorist and we both know colorists who are like nope these are my things and yeah that's all i'm ever going to touch you know? and that's fine you yeah. know um they, they just touch the three trackables in front of them and that's great yeah um you know i'm i'm not like that i go to the the, the toolbox um to 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 figure out okay well, what can i do with this um and adapt it to what i'm doing yeah um, so cool yeah one thing that uh stuck out to me that you mentioned a minute ago is when your client walks into the room they have an idea of what color grading or what color correction is sometimes it's right in line with like what you're able to do and what you feel like you can bring to their project sure sometimes like you said maybe it's not maybe they're in like a 20 years ago or a 10 years ago sort of mode yep how do you like work with clients who are coming from all different sort of POVs. Yeah, it, it's um, sometimes you have a client who who knows exactly what's, what, what they want. Mm-hmm. And they'll kind of like tell you and lead you to what, what they're after. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have other clients that you have shot something and they've gone, they've shot it in this direction. And then they've kind of looked at all these looks and styles and say, well, I want to move this film that I've shot and make it look completely different. And that sometimes is a little difficult because you're really wrestling with the core. Yeah. Like of the, the nature film. of the image. Yeah. And then you have some clients that come to you and really want to c- collaborate with you. And, uh, I'm shooting this film. This is what I'm thinking, you know, so you can really have a discussion about it. Uh, you can talk about lenses, you can talk about LUTs, um, do film tests. Um, uh, and I, th- I th- ultimately, I think that's the most beneficial way because then, then you're working with the filmmakers, you're on the same page before you even start shooting. Um, and I think it's reflective between, you know, all the way from shooting through dailies, uh, to final color because you also have that issue of of if dailies isn't really looking how they want it to be everyone gets used to it it's always a struggle to change it you know because yeah. it's that whole like people get used to looking at it and that they think that's their film that's my image yeah 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 but often it's not if it's badly done yeah. um uh so that is that is always a it's always a consideration i mean you I enjoy collaborating with the filmmakers, um, um, especially like a lot, for instance. Um, the way I, the way I look at a lot is, is, is a, a lot to a colorist is like a lens to a cinematographer. And let me explain what I mean by that. Is that a cinematographer has a camera? They they they'll choose their camera, and you can put a really nice sharp lens on that cam- camera you can you know point that lens into a light and it, it has minimal flare it's sharp from the center right to the edges oh. and it looks great or you could put an anamorphic lens on there or you could put a vintage lens on there and it's all all of a sudden the image is softer there's resolution drop off point into a light it flares, it has aberrations. It's so, so, you know, they're throwing all that contrast and resolution away. Why? Because it's of the look and the feel of that lens, mm-hmm. right? Just because you're throwing stuff away doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so it's a stylistic and a feel, right? So for a lot, it can be the same thing for a colorist. You can put, you know, let's take ARRI camera, for instance. You can say, take a K1S1 standard ARRI LUT, and it's going to give you the best-looking image for that ARRI camera. Uh-huh. 
gives you all the color, gives you nice deep blacks, highlights. It's exactly how the manufacturer intended the images to look. Mm -hmm. You then switch that out and say, put in say a film lot, the blacks aren't quite as deep, the, the highlights roll off early, the colors aren't as saturated, the hues are different, like greens roll yellow in the highlights, blues go cyan, yellows go warmer. Like you're essentially throwing all that color and contrast latitude away. Mm -hmm. But why for all that look and feel, right? So uh, that's why I always think of them as, as, as similar, like a, you know, the lot to a colorist. Oh, that is fantastic. So filmmaker or a, D, a cinematographer comes to me and says, I have this show. Like I just finished this show. Um, and it's probably one of the most creative lots that I've produced for a show. Um, and I, I feel sometimes it's, it's good to have a little bit more latitude up your sleeve when it mm -hmm. comes generating a lot, but then there's times that, you know, you, you, you don't want all that latitude. You do want to throw that, those, yeah. those lati that latitude away and force your hand into a certain way. Cause you've always coloring through a lot. So if, if, if the lot is a restrictive thing, um, then is like, well, how restrictive do you want to be up front? You know what I mean? So, so it's always a bit of a challenge. Um, but you can, you know, on this particular uh, film, I was, I was able to, you know, they wanted a, um, uh, the, this, this, the cinematographer gave me a reference of, uh, it's like a, a Slim Adams um, poolside photo. It was shot. Um, in the late sixties, early seventies, I think, and um, uh, looked it up. It was like Kodachrome, um, so it kind of had that film. I, I don't know how it was. A, it was a still, it wasn't motion picture, but so I don't know how it was printed. But um, I kind of knew the the film stock that they were using, so I was able to speak to my. You know, we have a at Company Three, we have a a color science department and they're great uh, when it comes to building a lot. So, uh, you know, one, we have thousands and thousands of lots there and, you know, all the films that we've done at company three, we have a history of that. So not only can we pull from those lots, we can build our own. Um, so for this, for this show, I I basically took, um, I think it was a, a, a Ari show. So I I basically took the basic K one S one, and then I found the the film lot that best matched the Kodachrome Kodachrome look of of the still, and combined them. Um, because what I wanted was you know it was because everything gets colored in HDR. So, you know, it has a, has a, a newness about it, like a modernness. Um, so you want to have the range of, of say the, uh, HDR. I mean, sometimes you, you know, you never really want to go to a thousand nits, but whatever nit range, wherever you, you want to go, wherever you want to go, whether it's like three, four, 500 nit range, then obviously the black. So I, I always kind of like starting with the, with the film, with the camera lot, um, and that gives you the right amount of roll off in the highlights and in the shadows and the gammas kind of suits that camera. So, yep. but what I did was take some, some aspects of a film lot that, uh, I wanted and combine them. So I took the, the color values of the film lot and combined that with the, the luminance values of a, of a traditional camera lot. Um, cool. And, and it, you know, and then there's still choices to be made. How, 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 what sort of white point, you know, color temperature you want your white point, whether, you know, you want to just be clean D65 or maybe a little warmer than that and then adjust it. And then, uh, you obviously then have to check, make sure your whites, you know, when it rolls off, it's exactly how you want to roll off and check it in 
bright scenarios, pointing to lights, um, make sure there's the there's no real bad clamping issues. Sure, blacks need to roll off. Hit black as you know. Uh, at some stage, you you will need to hit uh, pure True black. black at some yeah. point. Um, so that's important. And then the color, uh, which you're taking from the film lot, you also need to make sure like high, high saturation, high luminance colors, like, I don't know, it's like a fluorescent sign or doesn't right. clip or clamp in strange ways. So, um, and once you've got all that together, you then combine that and, uh, je- I, you know, I did that all in the color corrector. And you, the other thing is mixing these l- LUTs or these, yeah, LUTs and combining them in the color corrector. You have to be careful because some, some, some things can't come across when you build a LUT. Right. Um, uh, or build a cube. So you, ha- you have to check your work and make sure nothing's broken. Uh, so there, there's some trial and error, definitely. And I'm sure this is part of what you rely on your color science team for to support you in figuring 100%, out. Yeah, for finding it. Sometimes I like push it a little far, and I'm like, I go, did I break anything? Do I? Can you check this? Like they'll, and they're yeah. like, you know, like, oh no, it looks good, and you know, or no, no this really, you really you should went too hard. Yeah, <laughs> there's a little bit too much compression in the blacks here, or or or. You know, they'll make you, maybe they, they'll they make you aware of stuff, you know sure. what I mean? And then you're like, start questioning yourself and go back and tweak. Yeah. But, you know, that's what they're there for and they're great to lean on, um, on those situations. Yeah. And you obviously have a, you know, that's, yeah. you've got some of the, the best color science for mo- talent yeah. for motion imaging in the world. Yeah. The company three. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's super cool. Like so many things are, are standing out to me as you're sharing all this, but one of the biggest things is we're hitting already for the second time in our conversation on like trying to figure out how to put this. Like you're a colorist and your images, like to me, one of the the like hallmarks of your images that uh, and on the projects that you work on is like you're really using color and they feel colorful and rich and separated and uh, vibrant. But we've talked already about like the emphasis on contrast over color and nailing that at your foundation. Yep. And you're talking about skewing and selectively discarding or compressing colors mm-hmm. in pursuit of, as like core parts of your process for getting what I'm talking about. Yep. That's very counterintuitive. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I love about color is that it's just an experimental process. And as I said earlier, there's no bad color. You know yep. what I mean? So it's it's choosing the right color for the right show, uh-huh. um, whether it's more grounded, um, traditional type looking, has weight in it, uh-huh. uh, limited color palette, or something more modern that's like, you know, using HDR to kind of really brighten, give you a nice dynamic range a really clean white point that's totally neutral, deep blacks, um, more saturation. You know what I mean? And so it, yeah, there's so many things that, uh, choices to be made. Um, and choosing, choosing, the, um, you know, the lot is just the beginning, right? Uh-huh. So you always, you know, when, when, you, when you are choosing a lot, you, it's a, it's always like, um, do you do it in the LUT or do you do it in the color corrector? Uh, right. So even though you want to have the create this world with the LUT uh, and with your color science department, you don't want to put one hand or arm tied around your back and, you and limit it. yourself. You don't want to overcook it, right? So, um, like saturation, for instance, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of people love a desaturated image. But it's saturation uh, is not one of those things you should be dialing into a lot because it's a, such an easy operation, color correction wise. It's just going to, you know, hamstring you down the track. Um, Makes sense. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's certain things you pick and choose to 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 put into a lot um, because that's not just a color correction. It's 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 the boundaries of your color color palette or world. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And of course it's going to end up 
biasing your production counterpart's decisions yes. either in a good or a bad direction. Yes. Yeah. And you can be fighting. Like if it's a bad lot, sometimes I've been handed a lot. Like the DBs are like, I want to use this lot. And it's like, so you're, you're constantly fighting against that lot. Um, right. Uh, Who's coming to you and saying, I've got the lot. I don't think you got this, Siggy. Yeah. I've got the lot. Yeah. I mean, everyone's different. Right? <laughs> Everyone is yeah, different. Sure. So, um, and look, it doesn't happen that often. Like if it's, if it's, that broken, I will call like, it out. I'll reach out and say, you know, this is going to be problematic. Sure. But you, you want to respect their wishes and you know, yep. maybe they've used it in the past and um, that may have suited that film, but every, every film is different. So, yeah. Well, and it's, you know, back, back to uh, the theme of like how our production creatives relate to color correction. That can often be like a, I feel like like a security blanket of like, I know this lot, I know what it does, I like what it does. Yeah. And so I feel like I have I can exert a little control over the process if we're using this lot that right. has been with me for a while. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, I've got like, there's, there's so many, so many projects of yours that I want to pick your brain about. Um, one of the first ones that comes to mind, uh, just because I was, I've been taking a look at it recently is The Boys. Right. The Boys you had an absolute party with the color in there. Like the color is such a part of that storytelling yes. because you're in a world that's somewhat elevated, like as the baseline, but then there's like movies within that oh, yeah. world, like Hollywood blockbuster movies within yeah. this elevated world and the color cues, like yeah. it tells me where I am. Like yeah. it's really a narrative device there. Yeah. I mean, tell me about like the the process of designing the, I'm sure plural looks for that show and how it evolved. Yeah. I mean, uh, when, when I did the pilot, uh, the filmmakers reached out to me and said, you know, we want this like really, it's going to, it's dark, it's gritty. They really want, wanted to push the look of the show. Um, so there was a lot of work done up front with the lot. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I remember, I remember I, I was actually in, uh, the, the show was shoots in Toronto and I was actually shooting, I was actually coloring a film in Toronto at the time when they were, so it was perfect timing. Um, they came in to the office and, um, we, we went through a whole bunch of lots and, uh, it was a, it was a really hands-on process, mm -hmm. um, and showing them like some options and they just wanted to push it more and more and more. Cool. Um, so I was very excited, but you know, I was also in the back of my mind. It's like, is this, are we going too far here? Right? Like often filmmakers are all excited about the show and they want to push it, but you know, after they shoot it and were in post, the reality is, is like, you know, the studio made like, it's all too dark or it's all this or that. Right. Um, so you always have to leave a little bit up your sleeve and um, not put all your eggs into the LUT basket. Uh -huh. um, so, so yeah, it was, that, that was the initial, initial part of that process. And then, um, which really set the tone for the show because uh, we, we we really nailed a good lot up front, which was used for the dailies process. So everyone was from from the get go was and they're shooting through that lot. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and like yeah. lighting based on the higher ratio. Absolutely. Of it. Yeah. So which was which was perfect because then you know they could make they could see on set if things were getting too dark or too contrasty or whatever. Right. So they could con compens uh, compensate on set. Um, and then, then the post process, you know, they have these, uh, anyone who's seen the show, they have these cutaways to like, you know, on air studio looks. Um, and then they have like the Vought feature film, which is even pushed even further. And they usually have like a, uh, a, a, a more of a washed look like the, the Vought feature film has a, a, a sort of almost to a sepia, but like with, with some color, with some great through, colors yeah. covered yeah. in there. Yeah. And then we, we pump up the, so the texture of the grain, um, to really contrast it with, cause 
with the with the show because the show generally has there's a lot of blues and cyans and greens so it, it really is a, a cooler palette uh-huh. so going warmer for the um uh for the feature film type cutaways uh contrast really nicely uh the show also is has a you know we're sitting probably like a 30 30 percent um desat level on it so everything has a certain level of desat and then when you cut away to the on-air studio we are full saturation um and you're probably out from underneath any kind of fpe or yes like that yeah and we we dial back the contrast we actually don't even we use a we actually use a regular uh camera lot for that yep um so we have the color range is all you know is all there the saturation brightness uh-huh. um it's you know we're we're, we're, we're emulating a, a, a sort of a news presentation type type look but by the way, you're still making that look good, which in my, like the, so much of what we've talked about thus far, like yeah. a nice, like strong mid-tone yeah. contrast and a good roll in the bottom yeah. and the top and yeah. some confined print gamut type stuff. Yeah. That's like a good recipe for like, that's a great place to start yes. with color grading. Doing that broadcast look, but still making the images look great. Like you do that really, really well. Yeah. You- you also have to be a little careful is that you don't want to take the viewer out. Like it doesn't, it needs to be different, but it still needs to be in the boy's world. Interesting. Without really taking you out, like being so like hitting you over and it's like, Oh, what am I looking? What am I looking at now? Yeah, like, so, why am I looking at like, so it still has to have uh, certain elements um, of what, what things are. Um, so it is, there is a balance to that. Gotcha. Um, so is there st- like maybe like a little kiss of like a, maybe a lot that's being used elsewhere, but just scaled back? Yeah. Well, not a lot more, more col- for this just more color approach, correction, like better. maybe, maybe a hint of, of coolness in the blacks or something like that. Got it. Uh, just to attach it to where it's come from. Um, especially if it's a, if it's a, a TV screen within the image, um, it still has to live in the same world in that world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's always a fine balance. Got it. Yeah. I, I, I derailed you. I just had to jump in cause that's that I always see you do that well. And I always admire it cause that's, that's hard. Like yeah. the broadcast clean right. modern yep. quote unquote look, making that feel good. still. yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there's, there's a, a lot, a lot to the look. They're great filmmakers to work work with and they're Uh they're very open to you know let letting you do you know uh, do your thing and um once once we especially after like the pilot and the first few episodes they let you go to to do your thing obviously uh being aware of faces and details because you you know it is a dark show but you still want to see people's eyes uh and expressions that's an important thing so at times there's a, some windowing uh, you know uh, eye protection um uh trying to get a little ping in their eyes just so that you know you see the emotion um um and then there's you know a lot of shaping windows and things like that so uh-huh. um uh yeah it's uh you know it, it allows you to the show allows me as a col- colorist to really express sort of sort of the range of 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 colors and palettes and you know really have some fun with it you know what i mean without um without uh being uh too sort of red regimented it's like uh it really gives you a little little flexibility it's the perfect show really to work on it's fun um the people are fun the crew's fun so uh and you know if you're into that sort of humor, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's great to watch. Yeah, absolutely, a great great show and and great collaboration mm. uh, between you and the uh, filmmakers. Um, okay, so another project that comes to mind as we're talking about all the different ways that you can shape color depending yeah. on creative intent and uh-huh. frame contents and all that stuff. Wednesday has like a really unique, different look than right. a lot of your other uh, projects that I've seen. Tell me about that. <clears throat> that show. Yeah, I mean that one is uh you're right. I mean um I went with a, a, a more of a cleaner 
traditional look because mm-hmm. I saw the images or the test frames that uh, uh, David Lanzenberg, the cinematographer, was shooting and lent itself to, once again, it lent itself more to um, using a more traditional or regular uh, camera lot. I think there was some slight tweaks to it, but mm-hmm. not. It wasn't. I wasn't too heavy handed on that one. Uh, and we wanted to create a world where Wednesday and her family were in this kind of more monochromatic world compared to the world around them, the, the world that they lived in, mm-hmm. and um, without sort of going too obvious so it was more of a subtle thing um just with uh wednesday's skin tones uh there the adams family were always w- dressed in like black and white type tones so any any no color um and in wednesday's bedroom or dorm it was um uh her side of the do- room was monochromatic uh so there was always this subtle shift of um, uh, desaturation. I mean, not it, just marginally compared to everything else around her, um, just to give it just a hint of differences. And that was that was kind of the main the main thing theme throughout. Um, and that's I'm sure more of a correction than anything you're hard baking into a LUT, right? Correct. Yes, it was, yes, exactly right. So wanted, um, you know, the, the white, the white points were just a really clean D65 and in HDR it was, it was probably, I think around 450 nits, I think the white values. So a little higher than, you know, sometimes I go down to like 350. Um, so it's a little higher, more pushed, cleaner. Um, the colors, like there's there's colors in there that are like really popping primary, yeah. like unconstrained. Yeah, that opening scene, like that. for instance, in the, in the pilot where they're driving uh, to Nevermore and um, you've got these uh, beautiful like fall leaves everywhere and like the saturation of that. Um, and by the way, they did – did some pickups on that location and it wasn't full. They were all green. Oh, you had to break uh, out your old tricks. So I had to, it's like, yes, make, make, there was a few cutaways that um, we had to grab some of the greens and, and make them fall. And, and it gold. worked really, really well. Wow. Um, never would have known. Yeah. And uh, so you're in this like colorful location and you got this black car driving down the road and then you cut inside and, um, uh, uh, everything's monochrome except for these velvet, red velvet uh, seats in mm-hmm. in in this car, and um, they they weren't that poppy. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be nice just to um? R- so rather than desaturate them, I actually enhanced the red. So you, there was always that contrast. So sometimes it was a matter of desaturating things and sometimes it was enhancing the color around them and it just depended on the scene um yeah it's definitely one of my favorite scenes of of, of the show Great scene. um that uh, that whole opening um and uh you know and just making sure the blacks were really sort of rich um and uh you know there's a lot of uh blues but they were kind of saturated and Probably more than I normally. I would uh, say so. Do. Like, uh, like if you look as at, a fan, yeah, looking l- at it, yeah, it um, a little, a little more saturated, and and yeah, so it was great working with with, with Tim Burton as well. Um, uh, although I didn't get a lot of time with him, uh, the the times that we worked together was was great. He had uh, some, you know, working with uh, such a creative filmmakers it's you always learn something uh yeah. you always will learn something so just to get into their mind space and and uh understand what they're looking for and understand your and and work with those those people um to to get their vision on the on the screen yeah uh, it's great i mean that leads me to something else i i uh gotta ask you about is like 
we've we've talked a lot in this conversation about craft and technique and you know like even just technical things understanding how to work the box whether it's yep. 1982 or 2023 right but like so much of what we do is like being in the room and being able to like make clients feel heard and get their vision on the screen yep how do you like what are your principles for that how have you developed those muscles over the years yeah i mean a lot of color correction is about com communication mm -hmm. and and you can have 10 different people look at a image on a monitor and you ask them to explain what they're seeing yeah. in a color sense and I, I i bet you'll get 10 different answers back for sure so part of the color is is, is trying to understand what they're trying to com uh, you know communicate to you and there's this all, always there's this conversion of like what are they saying like try and really understand them um so that that's like one thing and then there's like really listening to what they're wanting um uh it's always a little tricky when you have uh uh people in the filmmaking area where they kind of want to push you in two different directions so then there's like usually you know, a, a discussion that needs to be made. Like, are we going this way or are we going this way? And sometimes it's like, well, let's just sit on it and move on. Let's go one way and let, like, we'll move on. And uh, sometimes it's rather than just spin your wheels on one scene is set it and um, move forward and then come back, watch it. Uh, and often it, 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 um, it tells you in the end, like this is not right, or sure. this is this this is a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's often best not to get bogged down on on stuff, especially if it's not right. I I like move like moving on because I always find going back with fresh eyes helps so much, especially if you feel that the scenes around them are dialed in. Sure, then you can kind of watch it as a run, and uh, that trouble scene is like. Mm. Maybe if we do go this way, it might help, you know, uh, make it a little darker or, or uh, needs to be a little more poppy. And, and, and it usually reveals itself eventually. Um, just, don't be, just, just don't be so impatient at the beginning. Sometimes it's best just to move on. It's like a, it's kind of like quicksand, those things you get into. It's like the longer you stand there, the more you sink into <laughs> Not being yeah, able to get there, get yeah. what you want, and 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 sometimes you you're you know you you may not see it initially, mm -hmm. um, you know uh, you may have a preconceived idea of what it should be, and you think it should go down this path color wise, mm -hmm. and it's just not working. It just doesn't feel right or natural. Um, and it can be just a, a contrast thing mm -hmm. um, uh, that it's just too dim or not bright enough or, or whatever it is. Um, and it's often best to to move on and and you know give it a couple of hours, go back and like usually it reveals itself. It's like oh, light goes off. Um, it's just a discovery process. A lot that of makes time. sense. Yeah, and that that takes I th I, I think experience and confidence on your part to be like, Hey, we're, we're going to get this just yeah. but right now. We should yeah. put a pin in it and yep. go move on something else. Yeah. And sometimes the, 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 in the room, it can be, um, you know, if you've got 10 people and they're like, why don't try this and try that and try that. Um, you know, and you, you go through that process and, um, uh, often I, I find that, you know, maybe once the session is over then go back and revisit just when you have some quiet time and and play around with it a little more mm -hmm. sure and, and and you know uh if 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 it's not you know if you kind of feel that the client's still not quite happy with that scene or a particular shot yep um, that makes sense cuz in the room when during a session you're trying to often please everyone and, and you end up with a compromise. 
Right. And you've got to solve everything has to happen in real time. Yes. When you're in the room. It's they, not well, they used to, they used to, to that whole real time, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if nothing's, if it's not playing back in real time, you got to cash it or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, it can, it can get in the way because people are just used to, you know, color being real time. It's, you know, um, but, um, and you can, in that real timeness, you can, you can dial in a lot of looks very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, when you, when you start having to, when you have a lot of layers and a lot of things going on, you have to be quite organized. Um, cause Clients don't really like the whole waiting for a cash. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just like that, that room of like a colorist sitting and going like, could it be this? Or just sitting there and doing nothing for five seconds while you chew on it. There's like very little room yep. for that when you're yeah. with clients, I guess. Yeah. No, you, um, understandably. Uh, but yeah. then there's other clients that are happy for you to experiment and, and they were like, just give you five minutes and see what you, you know. Right. And it's quite nice to have that little discovery time and, you know. Um, or th there's a scene and they, they want to put, um, add a slight glow around lights to give it a little bit more atmosphere or the light, you know, the lights are, are color temperature of the lights are too pale. They want them more sort of tungsten-y and, you know, so you, you might have to go through the scene and just balance out those lights. It's good, you know, sometimes it's nice to have, they'll like give you that exercise to do. Yeah. And take a minute uh, to do it. You know, they'll have five, 10 minutes and then they'll come back and watch it. And so that's a nice way to work. Um, uh, yeah. So, well, and I'm sure it varies too. Like on the, we, we haven't even talked about, like you do all kinds of different content. Like you do shows, you do films, you do commercials. And I'm sure those, you know, divisions on those lines are different in terms of the clients who come in and what they need and, you know, how much time you have and all that stuff. Yeah, very different. I mean, um, a, you know, if you're working on a 30 second commercial, it can be, you know, it's very concentrated. Um, you're in and out in like a handful of hours. Um, uh, so it's very full on and usually you have a lot of voices people's opinions mm -hmm. um and it's great when everyone's on the same page but can be difficult when you know everyone wants so something slightly different um so you you know as a colorist you have to na navigate around that um uh whereas um a feature film you you know it's a it's it's uh it it's obviously a longer process, you know, you're dealing with, you know, 80 hours on a smaller film to, you know, a few hundred on a, on a bigger visual effects show. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and then on a, on a, on a, on a TV show, it's, that's kind of like a marathon. You know what I mean? I'm working on a big visual effects show for Netflix right now. And it's like, you know, it's a 12 month process from when you start to the end for eight episodes. So, uh, you got a commercial, which is a, like a sprint race. Um, um, but yeah, it's, uh, and, and, you know, I, I do, I do love uh, TV. Um, there's so much, um, amazing content out there now Yeah, and just the clients, uh, I th and I think it stemmed from like studios, like the streamers, like really allowing the filmmakers to, to have that creativity in post. So I love working on, uh, TV shows right now. Like the studios really allow the filmmakers to, to create these worlds and looks so many opportunities to showcase what I can do. So I really love working on those long form shows. I mean, it, it shows and, and the artistry that you're bringing to those shows is what's really helping to elevate them to the level of cinema. Like yeah. they, they don't, nothing about those shows, mm -hmm. like any of the projects we've talked about, they don't feel like TV. 
Yeah, it's not your traditional uh, network broadcast type shows anymore. Um, they're they're full on creative uh, and visually interesting shows. I mean, I feel like that's uh, another great example of a theme that I see like in our conversation today and in all of your work. Like, at the end of the day, you're 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 just a creative like visual problem solver. Yes. That takes so many different forms. If it's like. I am oh, 100%, you know, yep. working under a lot. I'm working free form, like yeah. in your, you know, like early yeah. tell us any days. Yeah. I'm on the edit page. I'm on the color page. I'm in a yeah. plug-in. Like you're just, and it seems like you really enjoy all the different I potential solutions. I love it. Yeah, yeah I really do. Um, and, um, you know, as you said, some colors just want to color, use their three track balls. But I, you know, I'm like, I'm that, that artist who, loves a challenge, uh, happy to take on things. I probably, sometimes I, I find myself taking on something and then I'm like, have I taken off more than I can chew, but somehow get through it. You yep. know what I mean? And now um, you know how to do that. And now I know, and now, you know, I've ticked that box and now, now it's, I can do that. Um, there's like a show on, I'm working on right now where they wanted uh, a custom transition from a shot to shot. It goes from like reality to like a, like a dream world. And they wanted, they had like a standard plug-in, like a glow dissolve or something. And it just wasn't filmic enough. So they asked me to build and create a transition. So I, you know, I, once again, jumped into the edit page using some standard plugins, but then a lot of that ha I had to also do in the uh, color corrector because they needed to be after the color correction. Right. Um, so, and some some had to be before the color correction. So, uh, I created these custom looks where the image kind of distorts and you got this chromatic aberration and um then you got the dissolve and some some sort of soft soft glow and a and a more um a tighter glow so multiple levels of glow um and they were like well, this is fantastic yeah. so now i'm like okay I got throughout that the, the whole tv series <laughs> you every time we, we do a flashback it's like oh, we need to like so you know um but hey, it's it was fun. It's fun to discover and play around with that sort of stuff. And, yeah. Well, um, I'm going to be watching uh, a, a, whatever this show is someday soon, and I'm going <laughs> to spot it and go like, "That's what he was talking about." Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, that's super cool. I mean, you've got like an amazing craft and a, a cool job, and you know your collaborators are lucky to have that type of 360 mm -hmm. creative approach uh, as part of their, you know, like the resources to bring it to life. Um, so thanks so much for joining me. I feel like we've we got to come back. I know. Can thanks do, for like, the invitation. Hours, I know, right? We could, <laughs> we could be here all day. Yes. Literally. Yeah, truly. Uh, it's been great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here so much, man. Wonderful. Take care.